Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my first plasticity. I've heard from past events that they've been wonderful, and so far my experience in the morning is in the conversation before we started has been just excellent. So really looking forward to the conversation we have today in collaboration on solving some of the challenges we face. And we're going to continue that uh, this morning with this panel. Uh, as Doug mentioned, we're going to discuss the intersection of design and sustainability and how to achieve scale. Um, before I introduce our panel, I did want to just set the stage for you. Hopefully this works. Do we have the slides loaded, maybe? Well, if someone can, uh, again, we'll have to work on getting slides up. But, um, you know, so my, my personal story of how I got involved and how, uh, yeah, Doug, it, so this is my personal version of the images that we've been talking about over the morning. We'll talk about the rest of the day. This is in Narragansett Bay. Um, I run across, along the East Bay bike path. Not as much as I should these days, but when I do run, um, I see more than that than I like. You can see the plastic particulate there. And this really saddens me because I spent my entire career in helping des design and produce plastics. Uh, I work for a company called Sabic. We're a top five global manufacturer of chemicals and plastics. And in that work, I've really come to value what plastics can do for society and how they can help us make things that are more affordable, how we can make things more durable, um, help to solve healthcare challenges, and many other things with plastics. Unfortunately, the challenges we face at end of life um, are threatening our freedom to continue that and really capture that full value. And so um, Sabic, uh, our company, and myself are really passionate about trying to work toward uh, bringing solutions and, and having collaboration around that. Um, the other thing that happens in my work at, at Sabic is I interact with designers a lot and helping them or working with them to take materials and put them into the shapes that provide us transportation, cars, household goods, etc. And in that, I become, have become very inspired by the design profession and how design is kind of the translation between the intent of the brand owner or the idea and the manufacturability and the material choices that make that real. And um, that space is what we're going to explore today, the design profession, this role in helping us achieve scale, helping to build demand for recycled materials, uh, helping clients to consider uh, the sustainability dimension a little bit more frequently, um, et cetera. So there is a number of surveys. I'm not sure how visible these are, but there's a number of surveys on the role of sustainability and design. And we tend to see that the design profession just tends to be much more excited about sustainability or more excited about sustainability than the general public in their personal interests. Um, but when it comes to our day-to-day -day job, we do have examples. We're going to talk about some really incredible examples of um, design incorporating sustainability features. But it, when it comes to the average portfolio, engineering project, design project, it's safe to say that most design projects at least in the United States, are not yet considering sustainability on a, an everyday basis. There are great examples. We'll talk about some of them. And our panel is really to discuss how do we get to a future where most of the projects consider a sustainability feature, a sustainability dimension, not the other way around. So we've got a great panel to, uh, to, dis to discuss some of these ideas uh, this morning. We have Catherine O'Day from Green Blue. You know, those of you who are familiar with sustainable packaging and the work that Green Blue has done in that space, household name. Um, so we're looking forward to learning from you, Catherine, and your experiences in helping large brand owners explore sustainable packaging. We have Stefan Klapaneva, who is um, the vice president of the Northeast District of the Industrial Design Society of America, so knee deep in the everyday of the design profession will help us get a feel for what's happening there. Uh, Stefan also has experience in prior roles at uh, IBM on product life cycle management and how to incorporate the environment dimension. And Art Huang has joined us from Taiwan. And we'll see some examples of speak for himself, but my counterparts in Sabic that work in Taiwan have told me that Art is quite famous for his work. So really looking forward to learning from you, Art. Um, so what I'd like to do now to start off is just ask each of our panelists to share with us some of your experiences and your role in design and sustainability. And then from that, elaborate on maybe one or two things you think are working really well in incorporating sustainability in design or are the bottlenecks preventing further expansion. Um, so Catherine, I think we're going to have your, yes, we're lucky. So I'll turn it over to you, Catherine, first. All right, so as, um, um, it's forward, it's there. Okay. 
So um, I'm Catherine O'Day with Green Blue. I've been in the sustainability space for about 20 years, actually 22 years, because I go, the first year I started was 1992, the same year as the original Rio Earth Summit. Um, the last seven years I've been with Green Blue uh, and doing a lot of work in the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. Um, I personally am not a designer, as my colleagues here are, but Green Blue is a nonprofit that works with uh, business and industry to help them make, the, make um, their businesses more sustainable enterprises. One of the things that we do um, is focus a lot on design because I think all of you can understand, and especially the designers in the room, um, the decisions that you make at that point in the development cycle really are the ones that are gonna ripple across your supply chain and over the entire life cycle of the product. <clears throat> so I'm gonna focus um, most of my remarks around packaging since that's uh, a big piece of what we do at Green Blue uh, and is ob obviously also a big piece of uh, the plastic waste stream. Um, so to bring to the conversation about design, what I've thrown up here on, um, on the screen is our definition of sustainable packaging. While we've developed it specifically to focus on packaging, I think if you look at the criteria, you'll see that they really can apply to any product. Um, and it's really a, a way to get people thinking upfront in that design process about the entire life cycle. So we have eight key criteria. I'm not gonna read them all to you. Uh, I know you probably can't see them. From where I was sitting, I couldn't really see anything. But um, you know, essentially it's around uh, designing to uh, meet market criteria for performance and cost. We want you to optimize the use of recycled content, optimize the use of renewable content, um, be uh, con concerned about the material health of your product, so ensuring that it's healthy in all probable end-of-life scenarios, and make it designed for uh, end-of-life recovery, um, transport, uh, create, design, manufacture, uh, and use using as much renewable energy as possible. So you can see that it covers really kind of the whole gamut of the life cycle from sourcing uh, through design to manufacture use and then recovery. So you have that uh, closed system. One, one of the things that we thought about early on, uh, and this is really kind of a, an older slide that we have here, uh, because I think a lot of it is getting integrated now, but there were you know, standard design criteria around quality, performance, cost, et cetera, what all designers would take into consideration. And when we talk about design um, through the green-blue lens, we add a dimension of criteria to include you know, things like end of life, um, you know, recycle content, recoverability, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of developed a, an extended palette, if you will, of the parameters and criteria that designers should think about up front. <clears throat> so in terms of kind of opening comments, I'm just gonna stop there um, and send it on to my colleague here. Great, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Doug, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, just a kind of quick introduction. Uh, I think. Right. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Oh. So uh, we'll need to go through that. They're going to have to load them up for you. Yeah. And just to introduce myself again. So uh, I'm lucky that I happen to wear a couple different hats. So I have a day job that I work with a software company that focuses on the end-to-end -end product development process. So very large organization. Some of you of designers or engineers may have heard of the, one of the products that we've used, which is called SolarWorks. Uh, but it started off in CAD in the early 80s for aerospace and defense and automotive, and now we support the entire product development process. So when we look at it from a sustainability perspective, it's, it's imperative that we, we help support each of the 12 industries, or all the industries out there, on what, how do they go from that initial process of conceptualizing a product, why do you even need that product, to where is it going to end up at the end of, end of its life. Um, and I've been very lucky in that my, my journey, and that's kind of what I put up there on the slides, is my journey has kind of gone from um, early, has everybody heard of the, the idea of the story of tra tragedy at the commons? Mm -hmm. 
So a lot of, um, I'm seeing a lot of nods. Where I was lucky in that my second year in undergraduate as, as, a, as an engineer, um, I, I was in the Midlands in the UK, and beautiful environment, grassy knolls, and the, you know, the commons, as they call them. So for those that are not familiar with it, look it up. But they, the idea is basically you need to stop thinking of, of this world as uh, infinite resources and thinking of the fact that we are all on this teeny weeny little spaceship. And I was using the visual of uh, the latest uh, Gravity movie. You know, she's in that tiny, weeny, you know, teeny weeny little capsule and trying to you know, save, you know, continue to live, basically. And that's how we have to all be thinking every day. And so I moved from there um, to um, focusing on, on developing courses. And that's where another thing that's really important for me is education. So the STEAM initiative, I think, is very key for us. So STEAM stands for science, technology, um, engineering. It needs to be arts and math mm -hmm. instead of STEM, because there needs to be that design component as well as the engineering or or manufacturing or production component as well so that we continue to sort of uh, make sure that not all our kids want to become basketball players and rappers or something, you know, uh, because it's important. So I think we are up and running. So that's my bio. Uh, we're not going to go through that, but, um, you know, if we started off in the commons uh, in the UK. I kind of uh, fast forward to where I am today. Uh, we saw just uh, not too long uh, distant past we, what we had to deal with here with uh, Hurricane Sandy. So this is what New York looked like, you know, uh, almost out of I was on the top end of the of the 42nd Street, and everything below 39th was black. So if we have to be careful that you know we don't. That's the kind of the deal, the things that we're dealing with, these wicked problems that we need to be solving. But we can impact day to day. Every decision we make day to day has an impact. So that's kind of my journey. So we have to stop stop thinking like this and start thinking like this, right? So we're on this this little small little bubble. I think I um, who was at the table yesterday for dinner that was holding a marble? Mm. Like, there, thank you, sir. <laughs> Great idea because it reminds everybody of you know this is where this is the tiny little speck that we live on, and uh, so. The things that we do, I, work, I happen to be on the board, uh, I'm actually just uh, rotating off the board after being on the board of IDSA for two and a half years, where I think they've done a lot of great job with Ocala. And again, it's strategies for equal design and equal innovation. And uh, Catherine, I'm not going to dive into them, but you mentioned a lot of those. I think the idea is that we need to be making sure at the big picture that we're all working together to, uh, to kind of educate people and, and to leverage these, these strategies. Um, uh, and again, what I like to say is think local. I happen to be working at IBM where they talked about this a lot, but thinking big term, big visionary, but actually acting locally. So, you know, uh, there's a study from a bunch of students at Stanford a couple of years ago that talked about you really shouldn't be taking anything more than a two and a half to three minute shower. If you're taking anything more than that, you should might as well have a bath because that's how much water you're, you're wasting. So, again, Turn off the clock. Little things like that can have a huge impact. So we kind of laugh about it, but it's it's the kind of stuff that you can really have an impact there. And then again, I think uh, our previous two fantastic speakers touched on a lot of these things. Whether it's about you know, it's not just about product innovation. It's business model innovation. It's it's um, you know finance. All of those things, sort of uh, systems innovations. A lot of really things that we need to be innovating about. And it's not just as simple as oh, the product or the material that you used can't be recycled. That's that, that's the obvious. We've got to, we, there's a lot more stuff that we can be doing with supply chain and closed loop systems. So um, actually at the end, of, I just want to leave with this, which is um, this campaign. I happened to drive by uh, on the way back home from dinner last night and saw this on the side of the street uh, waiting for a traffic light. It's, there's a bottle and says, I can't, I, when I grow up or when I want to be recycled, I want to become a bench. So how can we think of the technology, uh, the internet of things, and what we can do and technology that we can use today to help create that and maintain that closed loop system. And that's what I'm going to end, end with. Thank you, Stefan. Um, okay, good. Abigail, can we uh, load Art's slides, please? Yeah, I laughed uh, on the shower. I'm guilty as charged in the shower. It's <laughs> well, we all are sometimes. Yeah. I mean, that's the reality of what we're dealing with. It's hard to keep it in mind in our everyday lives. Sometimes it's on for two minutes before I even get in it. <laughs> no. 
hello everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur. Thank you, Doug, uh, for inviting me. Uh, actually, I, when I was in graduate school, I uh, grew up like you know, looking at Mike's work. Um, so I really think that is the real value that we need uh, about collecting refuge and turning that into useful material, replacing virgin resources. So we started off trying to be valuable within that system. Uh, that's as simple as that. And uh, again, I, I'm kind of feeling a, a little bit ashamed that I'm on a, a design panel. I'm, I'm I mean it in the most uh, uh, honorable way. It's because we never consider, just like what you said, we never consider ourselves as a designer because we're always an engineering-based company. We have material scientists, uh, mechanical engineers, uh, all the way to uh, production engineer, all the way to industrial designer, which uses SolidWorks heavily. Um, they actually um, uh, come to us and says, you guys are published, and then how do you guys do all your system? Or how do you get all the material data? So we actually use CATIA mm -hmm. and SolidWorks together. Mm -hmm. Uh, and on all the 3D printings, etc., that linking with that system. Right. Okay. So, and then we recently just got a um, last year we got a award from you guys, the Industrial Design Society, on the Go Award with the uh, uh, electric car. Uh, uh, but uh, so uh, we do definitely do have many many crossovers, and ex totally agree with what Stefan just said that uh, in order for this innovation to continue, uh, in order for us, our generation of innovators, let's say, uh, if you call that, uh, to be valuable in the next generation, we have to deal with recycling, for sure, because that's the future of refuge. So we, we are a small outfit still, only about 50 people of engineers, but we are really thinking of trying to get to uh, all the stuff that is not in the market, but uh, so we recently built a food waste plant. Uh, we basically turned food waste, food, waste, which is leftover food waste, we turn that in, into ethanol, and of course all the leftover, we use that to power the plant, and from the ethanol, we turn that to ethanol glyco, that which in turn makes PET, and from PET, we make building products and materials. Um, so that is a plant in Taipei, uh, but to, just to let you guys know, we are blessed with the infrastructure in Taiwan and in Asia. And we also bless with all the trash from the United States and everywhere else. <laughs> so we get containers of that. Uh, I was just explaining to Kate uh, earlier that we uh, uh, e we, uh, we do e waste plant. Uh, we do we have an e waste plant that we recently built. Sorry, not that one, but I'll show you. Uh, we recently built an e waste plant, and the container that came in, uh, the, it has like my 10 years of worth of cell phone I found in the trash can. Mm. And they have around point, uh, 0 0.3 grams of gold per cell phone. And that's what they're doing and what they're collecting these materials for. And what this e-waste plant we built is interesting is that we use the leftover from the e-waste recycling. We turn that into a curtain wall system. And this is also documented by National Geographic uh, in the next year. So you will see a whole show based on that. So all that sun shading, all the canopies is made from PC, which is recycled DVDs, which are the same material as your, the sunglasses that's out there. And the sun shading is made from uh, epoxy uh, from the glass uh, circuit board and all the leftover glass fiber. Both of these are really bad when burned and they get into these fumes, which are completely uh, just crazy. So our idea is to suspend some of these material take the good quality of these material, which are very good, great fireproof material. Mm -hmm. So we use that for building uh, protection. So all that is designed with Katia and SolidWorks. Uh, and of course, uh, that's our most recent uh, adventure with Nike. Uh, you can see the store made from all recycled material in Soho, uh, Mercer 21, which is, uh, and it's actually quite published recently uh, because all the fixture systems are made from recycled ABS, uh, which potentially we could use Mike's ABS. Uh, and a lot of the fixture, we use 100% recycled PET to create felt uh, benches and chairs. And all these processes uh, are existing currently already, but no one wants to touch or 
enable recycled material to be part of that system because it screw up the machine, it kills the uh, process. So that's our our uh, value, I guess. Uh, we basically we were kind of stupid, self-funded, and we went to go design a machine, try to solve that problem, all self-funded, and everyone laughed at us, to tell you the truth. And that, I think, um, it's, and so that's why we're still like losing a lot of money. But I mean, we are doing quite a lot of that. There are six stores globally, Paris, London, New York. And you, I welcome you guys to take a look at these pinnacle store uh, by Nike, designed with the lowest carbon footprint, uh, single material, so everything can be re-recycled, no glue, mechanically uh, connected, uh, etc. Okay, I need, and one last thing is uh, we also built something that's called completely crazy, things that flies, things goes in, uh, things with Jackie Chan, things that moves really <laughs> fast. So, you know, we built these portable cafes all over China, all made from recycled material, to use that as a consumer communication devices to demonstrate the possibility of a uh, future that's made with recycled material. Okay, that's about it. Thanks, Art. Um, so we, we had a conversation out in the lobby this morning that uh, i like to build off of in the panel if I could. Um, you know, we talked about the importance of iconic projects and you were just sharing with us some of the projects. We can go down to Soho and see the store, that Pinnacle store. And, and we had experience in our own business in Sabic and trying to commer or commercializing a recycled material and we made this um, depolymerized PET, put it back into engineering materials. Uh, we even cradle the cradle certified it. But we never, I don't think we ever really did that iconic you know, visible, branded kind of effort with the product, and therefore it's just kind of at this point hasn't scaled. You know, it's talking about scale today. So I, I was uh, hoping that we can talk about Mark. Maybe you can start us off on the importance of these iconic projects and inspiring um, the rest of us to follow, and what role they play in scaling. Uh, we have a very simple model. Uh, we really have to appeal to our senses, like. Things have to be sexy, otherwise no one wants to touch it. Just like you don't want to be in the same room with someone that smells, you don't want to be in the same room that's, you know. So there's this movie that always inspires us to talk about that. It's like, I don't know if you guys know Zoolander, which also happens in New York. And there's a whole brand called Their Leak. No matter how stupid the models are, uh, but because they're sexy, things tend to, they can sell trash, basically. So most of us in this space are, highly technical, bright eye engineer. So how can we sell trash and make customer pay for it and see premium value out of that? And the, the, I think for us, it's very simple. It's this four letter word called sexiness, a uh, sexy, right? So as long as something is sexy, uh, and so how do you make building sexy? How do you make a material sexy? Uh, uh, it, for example, a space shuttle is beautiful, it's sexy. An uh, airplane fighter jet is sexy. A, 787 is beautiful, it's sexy. It's all made from plastic. It's all engineered plastics. So how can we use trash plastic and re-engineer it so it's sexy? So we built a floating, literally, uh, aerostatic dome with Nike in Milan. Uh, a pinnacle project, let's say, uh, it's all made from recycled PET. And uh, to create that uh, tension, uh, this thing that floats, and then and the awards that you guys gave us last year is also with the Nike you know, whole recycled PT structure, structure, no design, just structure, that support human body weight. And while you're walking on top of that, you see the motion and the movement and the suspension of these tension cables made from weights. So how, and our solution is sexy. In order for someone has to be sexy, it has to be athletic, it has to be strong, it has to be you know, put together. So maybe you guys can add on to. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, building off that, Catherine, I'm wondering in the sustainable packaging space, is it something else that catalyzes your clients to get interested in it, or is it some of that too? I and mean, what's the is our connection? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, tying it to sexy packaging. I mean, maybe I'm, it's I something else. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say sexy packaging, although there certainly are iconic packages. You know, you look at the Coke bottle, everybody knows it's a Coke bottle. But um, so what I think drives, you know, recycling, sustainability in the package, packaging space 
is, is a lot of um, consumer interest. I mean, I think it's both, you know, when you're in the supply chain, you're, if you're a converter or material, raw material manufacturer, your consumer is really B2B, so it's really your client, your customer. When you're at the retail end, it's the consumer. And, you know, in the world today, in terms of sustainability criteria, what the consumer thinks they understand and, and knows is recycle content, recyclability. So a lot of it is being driven because people want to respond to that consumer consumer demand to make them feel good, like they're contributing also to sustainability because you know when they take their product out of their package, it has an end of life that they can feel good about and responsible for. So I don't think it's so much sexy. Although, you know, I mean like, I wanted to pick up on what Arthur just said with a, a story. How many of you know, you know, Coca-Cola EcoCycle story with Will I Am? Okay, well some, but not, probably not enough. And I don't know why this isn't just like, you know, caught on like wildfire and booming across the airwaves. Um, you know, it's a fairly long story, but to keep it short, Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas uh, was giving a, a concert in South America. Um, you know, we talk about, I actually got to meet him at a lunch, Coca-Cola, mm. um, I'm not on? No. All right, so I got to meet Will I Am at, at lunch in New York here about a year and a half ago. Coca Cola put on with a handful of NGOs um, looking at kind of end of life solutions. And he, gave, he told his story of giving this concert in South America. And, you know, usually the artists and performers are sort of whisked off stage and then, you know, hoarded into a limousine and taken away before they see any of the aftermath. And, for some reason, this didn't happen one night, and they had to hang out backstage. And when he left the venue, it was just trash everywhere. And he, you know, sort of took that very personal and said, "I'm contributing to, you know, this destruction of, of the landscape and the environment." And so he actually approached Coca-Cola and got himself invited in. And Coca-Cola decided to collaborate with Will I Am to make sexy stuff out of trash. And so, you know, the, all of the um, PET bottles and other things that Coca-Cola now collects, those that can't go back into a bottle to bottle system, they're working with uh, many of the iconic brands, um, you know, the, the, the cool, the sexy ones, the beat headphones, Levi's, um, a couple of other things, turning this into a product and they call that material eco cycle with a K, so it's kind of coke backwards eco cycle, uh, and so it's the eco cycle material. And I'm just totally inspired by that story. And and I saw Will I Am was on video out here, so somebody around here knows the Will I Am story, Doug, I'm sure. Uh, and it, it's great fun. And I happened to catch him on TV last evening before going to dinner, and he's now um, building a car manufacturing facility. I'm not sure if it's using recycled content. I didn't see the whole show, but, um, and he's gonna have it manufactured in, as he called it, his ghetto, uh, <laughs> to get his people out. So, pretty cool story, and um, very fun guy, and good, good thing Coca-Cola is doing on that. Thanks for sharing that story. I uh, maybe we should pass that around. Thanks for sharing that story. That I also found that it's so inspiring. And someone just observed um, something that they felt they might have been causing and took action to do something different. So that's a, a wonderful story. Um, Stefan, I'm, some of the things that I've been inspired by in the de design community, I was hoping maybe you could elaborate on. Um, the Ocala Design Guide. You mentioned it briefly in the opening, and. We're not designers, but we've used that in our business to just share some of the concepts of design for sustainability to think about how we innovate mm -hmm. in the different the design, the strategy wheel that's in that guide. So I was wondering if you could just share some of the things that the design community is doing like Ocala to get more um, of your design community thinking about this, to educate and build awareness. Sure. So um, one thing I just wanted to highlight, uh, I'll give you a sexy story about packaging uh, and design. Uh, because I happen to be in that space. So if um, 
the example is very simple. It's, it doesn't necessarily have a lot of plastic in, in the story. But if you guys look, have you ever heard of the, uh, well, you think, do you consider Puma a sexy brand? What do you guys think of Puma? Okay, so a couple hands. But um, give you an example. Puma um, asked Yves Bihar. Yves Bihar is a very famous designer. And um, they were looking to try and figure out how can they kind of create a more sustainable uh, supply chain. Because they're sending a lot of boxes of shoes all the way around the world. It's a lot of volume, not a lot of weight. And it takes up a lot of space. So he came up with this concept, the clever little bag. So if you guys look that up, there's a fantastic video, it's viral, it's on YouTube, and um, that's, the, I mean, probably the best example of um, how designers and how design, industrial designers, have, have, can have a huge impact when they're left at their devices. Because somebody like Yves Bahar is such an iconic um, designer that the guy said, okay, go do your thing. 99% of the time, I cha the challenges that designers have is they were given Here's the strict guidelines. You've got to work within this box, and don't you dare go about it, outside it because you know we're paying you to just do this. I'm you know, talking to clients today that are saying, you know, if only we could be told, allowed to do what we want to do, we can be doing so much more here. Uh, but that's a perfect example. So if you have the opportunity to work with designers, let them at their you know let them be let them be creative, and you'll be surprised at what you come up with. You know, the idea is that why do you even need a box at all? And that was the solution. A clever little box or a clever, clever little bag became the solution because you don't even need the cardboard box that those shoes go in in the first place. They were able to, through design, eliminate the idea of a box. I don't know, I don't remember all the stats off by hand, but if you, any of you go to the website, you know, go to uh, YouTube, you'll see the video that talks about all those numbers. A tremendous impact. Uh, and, and that has had an impact on the brand itself because it's being seen as more ecological and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's one simple example. Um, you know, the idea, the other thing is, uh, again, working with, uh, we have an eco-sustainability or eco-design section as part of IDSA. So I encourage all of you to kind of uh, look it up. It's, they have even their own LinkedIn section that you guys can have a discussion. Um, the other things is, is um, you know, we're here at Plasticity. So uh, I'll give you an example. I think we need to be very creative with, with the way we use materials. And um, there's a great organization, in fact, in fact, we talked about it, Bob, about getting material connection involved. For how many of those know material connection? So a couple of hands. So I, I, would, ins I would ask that since you're all in, in sort of the plastics arena, you should all know who material connection is. What they are, they're online and physical library of materials. And uh, the amazing, the, the materials that I've seen that exist out there that people can be using for projects, for product development, for packaging design, um, are phenomenal. And you, unless you go and see them, you don't know what you can be doing with them. So uh, I'm, they frequently invite me to participate in their, in their roundtable discussions where it's basically, here's some new materials that were sent to us by manufacturers, like yourselves in many cases, and you know, let's come up with this workshop on how we can create, what kind of products we could be creating with these types of specifications that these materials have. And you'd be amazed at what we see. You know, whether it's recycled jeans, what they, like you said, you know, they put it in a polymer, they fix it, and now it's, it's used for tiles in playgrounds because it's durable, it's soft, kids don't, if they fall on it, from, you know, from, from a certain height, they don't get hurt. There's all these other things that you, we can be doing. So, uh, that's the sort of the, the, my two cents from a design perspective. You know, obviously you have the, the Ocala guides, you have uh, creative designers that can really think outside the box because they really do think differently. I mean, my wife tells me this, my parents, you know, and my family, they're like, I really don't understand how you think. And that's, I finally got to that point where like, oh, I see it. We do think differently. And then we talk, there's a, there's a concept of abductive thinking. It's not deductive uh, and, and so, in order to innovate, in order to come up, create with these, you know, come up with these new ideas, uh, many cases designers and industrial designers, innovators think differently. Can I, I, I got a sexy package. I thought of a sexy package. <laughs> um, it, and it goes kind of with a sexy product, I suppose. Um, I think it was our first speaker, Steve, showed it maybe. Um, method. 
Mm -hmm. They're, you know, one of the reasons that their product, not only because it's eco-friendly or, you know, it's um, a healthier product for us, they package it really in appealing packaging. And, you know, they're going to continue to do that even as they are now currently trying to take waste plastic out of the ocean and create some of their packaging from that. I think that'll be a challenge. I think someone also mentioned about how black packaging is very difficult to sort and, you know, this packaging is coming out black. So how they manage that and work through it will be interesting to see, but it's a great kind of pioneering effort in a sexy packaging. Thank you both for sharing your stories. I'm having a little difficulty with the late start knowing when the end time is. What's the, do we have time for some questions from the audience? Where are we? A quick, are there any questions from the audience um, for our panelists on design and sustainability? Can you just stand up and try to belt it out? We'll see if it. Did you guys hear that? What are the taboo topics? Can you give it? What do you mean by that? Is there? Can you give an example of what what, what do you mean by taboo? still teaching at Cornell uh, like University in the US. Um, so one of my biggest challenge with the designer, I think, uh, in this trying to address sustainability is that uh, a lot of the students are very, very visual based. Uh, so when they're not thinking about how product can be disassembled, uh, like we like there's so many common things. There's about engineering works, the disassemblies, um, Recyclability, recycle, uh, but in reality, in order for you to address that, it puts a lot of constraints on designers' creativity. I like constraints, but a lot of people don't, and so that is a. I think that is a taboo because you go to a design school, you go to an architecture school, you go to engineering school. It says you cannot do that. Single material, no glue, and they will be like, "What are you talking about?" You know, and they're like, "Then they are want green." It's like, no, it has, it has effervescence, it has this in it, it has that in it. No, I want green. And you're like, oh, okay. So that is the taboo for me. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to point out, I mean, when I thought of taboo, I thought of the idea of, you know, uh, how we, we are sometimes viewed as if we're, we talk about, oh, try and save the world, everybody's on those tree huggers. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that we, we're always shunned away from talking about it. And we're, so that's an almost a taboo subject because you're like, oh, we can't talk about it. Then it becomes political. Yeah. So you need to be, I think in my mind, is stand up for what you believe in. I mean, if you think this is, a, this is an important issue. I mean, obviously when we talk about uh, making, we, we all have to make a living. And that's what I joke about. We know sustainability has different, different means different things for different industries. I, I go to events here in New York all the time. There's a lot of bankers that have said, oh yeah, we're carbon neutral. Well, yeah, it's nice because all their stuff is virtual. So hello, all you need to focus about is your architecture and your building. So once you pay off carbon tax and that, then you're, of course you're carbon neutral. But companies that are making cars for a living or airplanes, they cannot really think, you know, it's, it's not as easy as saying, okay, we're just gonna write it off and pay some fine or whatever and offset it. So. You know, but let's have that discussion because uh, you know we can really make an impact, and there are ways to make it sort of impact that triple bottom line. I think that's the key thing we need to remember. So that it, taboo subject, you know, it's not about tree huggers, but it's a matter of what I can do for my industry. And if I can create a closed loop system so that I'm not adding any new material, if it's plastic or whatever that is, then I'm doing something right. So that's the impact, and it's, you know, take the discussion away or neutralize the discussion so that 
you know, we're not afraid to say what it is that we're doing. And, it, you know, we do want to create, we don't want to, we want to have a, a better future for our children. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. We all have to pay the, pay our bills as well. So strike that bill, that balance and, and don't be afraid to talk about it. And I think there's, there's, um, there's business models that are being created all the time. Will I am give you another example? I don't know, who saw Bill Maher on Friday night? I forget the guy's name, but there's, um, I want to say Richard or John or something, but one of the guys, he has this um, a band and he did a big project in the Philippines by himself, basically self-funded. And uh, so they're doing a recycling plant in, down in Haiti. Uh, and then in the Philippines is you know, getting rid of plastics out of the rivers because you know it's, it was able to monetize that system. So there's a way of turning it into a positive. Thank you both for the answer. That there was a difficult question, so thank you for that. So I'm going to thank our panelists for an excellent conversation. Um, I think we have a great day ahead of us, and we'll all be here the rest of the day. So feel free to come up and continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I would like. To I'd like to thank Bob as well. Uh, Sabic is one of the sponsors here today. Um, we have one more before the coffee break, and that is Lewis Perkins.